congratulations to Carl. And he will come up and welcome the rest of our panelists. Thanks for the intro, Candice. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carl Ramirez. As Candice said, I'm a recent graduated from with my bachelor's in health promotion education here at the U. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I identify as a first generation queer Filipino Ilocano American immigrant. And I'll be moderating today's panel discussion on patient voice, Asian Pacific Islander health and wellness. So since we are covering Asian Pacific Islander American experiences, we want to acknowledge that APIA designation is problematic. APIAs are a very diverse group of people comprising over 100 ethnicities. And the broad term APIA does not adequately address the diversity of language, immigration, socioeconomic, cultural, religious, and political histories of these ethnic groups. Moreover, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are racialized very differently because, sorry, because, um, because Asian Americans are viewed as immigrants, this often erases the history of settler colonialism that Pacific Islanders have experienced and their deferring health needs. Additionally, the APIA community is generally left out of conversation having to do with race because we are an invisible minoritized group. But it's important to recognize our voices and experiences, hence the purpose of the panel today. So as a facilitator today, I wanna, be, I wanna present the questions we have been given to make sure we are on track with time. We have a little bit less than an hour and have a lot to cover. So I wanna thank our panelists for agreeing to speak on this panel. So thank you for being here. And I wanna introduce you all to our panelists. Um, Samoana Matangi, um, Dr. Hena Fisk, and Dr. Ed Napia. So I want to begin with our panelists by introducing themselves in terms of how they identify, whether that may be race, gender, role in family, ethnicity, age, sex, socioeconomic status, or anything about you you want to share. And also to share your pronouns. So for example, he, she, they, or any other pronouns that you identify with. And a little bit of your background. So we can start with whoever. Yeah. Check. All right. Uh, my name is Samoana Matangi, and uh, I am half Samoan. My dad is from American Samoa, Pango Pango, and half Caucasian. And uh, I, I was a patient here at the University of Utah. Uh, I was in an accident where I uh, received an electrical shock of like 14,400 volts. And because of that, I lost my hands. I'm also a volunteer here. Uh, I volunteer with the burn unit as a camp counselor for their burn camp and also uh, uh, a peer counselor to burn patients. Um, and I, did I cover all the bases? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Hi, um, I am uh, Hena. Um, and I, my pronouns are she and her. Um, I identify myself as um, South Asian. So I'm uh, basically from India. Um, I came here to do my PhD in social work. Um, and uh, my experience has been um, with the healthcare here. I have, I think, visited every hospital in the valley the, uh, due to my pregnancy related and my reproductive health issues. I've been to LDS Intermountain and I have stayed over a month at the university hospital. Um, I have worked with uh, sex workers and their children uh, in India and here I've worked with um, elementary, middle school and high school uh, students, girls, um, based um, for the leadership training and um, I think that's it. 
Oh gosh, because they don't they don't hear this part anyway, right? Uh, uh, ko, ko te tangata ko rahiri. So uh, my name is Ed Napia, and I stand on the protocol of the. Ngāpuhi tribe from the Taitokiro district of Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I was born. Um, I'm a, um, uh, our mountain is called Hakataha, our ceremonial plaza is called Tofara, our meeting house is called Rangia Fiofio, our sub tribes are Te Whiu and Te Honihoni, and uh, our, great ancestor, our great ancestor is Rahiri. And I've had a bit of experience here at the University of Utah, both as a professor, but also as a patient. And um, what may or may not surprise you is that I live with diabetes. All right, um, thank you for sharing. I want to acknowledge that while our panelists embodies identities that may reflect the collective experience, um, their experiences do not speak for the whole Asian and Pacific Islander community. So we have a couple of questions here, and I want to mention that you answer these questions in your personal experiences. And the first question is, what are the methods you do when seeking health care? How do you select a health facility or provider? And what characteristics do you look for in a facility or health provider? Uh, uh, it's an interesting question for me growing up. My, my dad, he kind of just picked the closest one, the cheapest one. And that's where we went to. And uh, now, you know, I've learned a lot more that you can have your your own voice in choosing where you go. Um, it's took me a long time. It's took me about 40 years. Uh, and now I can decide, oh, this guy, I need to try a different guy. I want to see what a, another person says. And that, that second opinion has become more important as I grew older. But I was taught you just go to the one that you're told to go to, you know, and accept whatever they say. And you, if they say you have X disease, then you say, oh, I have X disease, and uh, I'm good with that, and I do whatever he says. You know what I'm saying? So that's the way we were raised. You uh, do whatever they say. They're a professional, and do what they say. But now I know. Possibly they could be wrong, and you need to raise your voice. And that's not something uh, uh, I was used to because we're used to just accepting whatever the 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 leader says. You know, uh, that's kind of how Samoan life is ran. They have a chief, and they say, and you say, "Yeah, okay, I'll do that. All right, thank you." <laughs> <laughs> um. I, uh, as a, um, me and my family, uh, the, how we selected our healthcare provider, uh, the, the facility, actually, a, um, because I was, uh, I was pregnant and we did not have insurance our first, uh, first time, and, um, so I actually asked my professor and she referred me to her research partner who was working in the community health center. And that's how we actually went to community health center. And since then we have been there, even though we have health insurance now, um, but the facility works with a lot of diverse community and they are really very professional, they respect. So that was one thing um, I looked forward to like you know like the respect they gave us and they understood our cultural background uh, the doctor there um, are a very uh, diverse dude and um, they work very uh, they work with a lot of different minorities they don't turn down patients if they don't have insurance uh, so though we don't need to go there we still go there and I think um, the first thing which um, helps me decide on which who to choose or which facility to choose as how they treat us 
as individual or how they treat our, my family. So, um, so that's the one key thing um, we look into. So um, my story is a person who's simultaneously not skeptical and then very skeptical about health care provisions, um, especially in the in recent months, um, the agency where I work who covered our health insurance, uh, we get Select Health and uh, as of the beginning of this year, Select Health will not cover any services that are done by the University of Utah. And because you know, I came to the University of Utah as a student in 1989, and it was natural to seek health care here, yes? And so I, since 1989 until the end of last year, this is where I came. And I was very happy with the services that I received. I thought that I was getting good care. Um, and so I started looking for a doctor at the beginning of the year and uh, I was told, I called that big new uh, facility on the corner of 11th and 4th and the first appointment that I could get was June 2nd and that is just ludicrous. Um, so I thought, well, there's got to be a way of finding a doctor because my sugars had plummeted and I needed to be seen as soon as possible. Well, I called the uh, membership advocate with Select Health and he looked around and after a while he says, well, there's a, uh, a doctor who's, who's accepting new patients. What's that all about, by the way? Accepting new patients. You have to wait in line to be accepted by a doctor. There's something wrong with this whole program and don't get me started because I could talk to you for the rest of the day on some of those issues, right? Uh, but he, this person was very helpful and he says, um, there is a doctor accepting new patients and this is their address and I says, you mean right down the hill from me? So um, I was able to uh, get a doctor in a uh, holiday and I've been seeing them since but now I have to um, find a new dentist okay and I have to make sure that the extra services that I'm able to that I need uh, such as an ophthalmologist is someone that's under their health care system and I'm going to state my soapbox statement right now we are the wealthiest nation in the world and yet our health coverage is poor especially for people of color or for people who have limited resources and I better stop there I'm not always a mean person, but most of the time I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next question is, have you or your family members experienced barriers to any type of health? So it could be physical health, mental health, maternal health. Um, this could be based on your APIA identity or any other identity recognizing that identities are intersectional. So intersectional meaning that the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender as they apply to given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and independent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Uh, most of the barriers that uh, I've experienced growing up uh, had to do a lot with class. Uh, I grew up on the west side over there of Salt Lake City and we grew up poor and uh, a lot of times when we needed health care we're going to the the um, what do you call that the those little strip mall kind health care instacare mm. instacare and and it's funny because instacare the doctors, they're trained to say, hey, you need an antibiotic or you need a painkiller, and that's it. See you later. No x-ray, no nothing to back up his uh, theory. Um, and uh, I, I can't say that I've run into anything that was related to uh, my race, except for the, the one time I remember they had this rule at the hospital that you can't have more than two people in your your room. And I'm like, my family's huge. Uh, we got like, uh, I got 13 uncles and about 82 cousins. And when only two can come in, it's going to be a problem. And then when they talk about 
I mean, they made us go to this other room where you could have visitors, lots of visitors. It's like the rec room or the, the lunch room. And then they're like, keep it down. And I'm like, that's not how we do things. We just kind of loud naturally. So uh, mostly it's class relate related for me. That's been my experience. Uh, for me, um, when I go to see like not the community health center because they know like um, that I speak English, but apart from there, if I go to the U hospital uh, or when I was uh, admitted at the U hospital or into Mountain, the first thing is like, do you need a translator? Or then when I start speaking English, they'll be like, oh, your English is good. Where did you learn it? And I'm like, you know, you're being um, uh, uh, passive aggressive way of um, insulting. And then the next thing, and also they look at my spouse and they're like, oh, do you need a translator too? So uh, that's like the first thing they they do. Uh, the second thing what I experienced like when I was in, um, in uh, admitted, uh, I had um, emergency surgery. Um, I was in a lot of pain, the, but the, some of the nurses did not validate my pain level and were just saying that, oh, you, you need to get up and walk. I'm like, you know, just having a C-section is not the same as other women having C-section. You have to see, like, uh, it's every patient is different, but they want to just put one a remedy for all of us. Uh, like, so it's like A, B, C, D, you need to do this, and you need to get out of the hospital in three days after giving birth, even though you have a traumatic um, and uh, like a emergency surgery. And so for me, it was like uh, the nighttime nurses, uh, they were like really rude. Like um, I was on oxygen and they would take it out and then when it would beep every five minutes they would be like oh we'll just put you back in oxygen like they didn't want to do anything like come in um to see check on me and then like um the other thing was like um uh, my child was in the NICU so i we had to be very careful but the um, assistant to the nurse I forgot what they called. Uh, she had cough and cold, but she would now wear a mask. So when I rec I, I had to ask, can you please room, like um, change the person, the assistant? Uh, she got offended. The nurse got offended. Um, there were like multiple like nurses who were really rude, um, and it was like so uh, rude to me. And their tone would change once I said that I had a PhD. Not only the nurses, but also the doctors, how they communicated, completely flipped from um, just saying that, oh, I have a degree, and, and that should not be the case. You are a nurse, you are a doctor, you have to respect whoever it is, the degree, the education, the background should not matter. But I have experienced so many times that the way they communicate completely changes once they know that oh I have a I have like a PhD and um, and then they will be like nicer and they'll communicate well. The other thing I experienced that there were so many I am in social work and I'm not against having social workers, but if you have four social workers in four hours and they ask you the same questions, <laughs> they need to connect with each other and it's annoying because you have multiple nurses, doctors coming in every hour they're asking the same question and you know like the patient is not feeling well and it, it gets really, really like upsetting for the per patient and for the family. So yeah, this, um, these were my experience. So this is kind of not exactly related uh, to the question, but uh, imagine this, if you will. Um, when I talk to someone over the telephone, they make assumptions about what I look like, and when they meet me in person, they're very surprised, because I think they're, they're surprised to see a person of color, okay? Um, but so I work uh, at an agency which provides, among other things, 
uh, health care referral services for American Indians. So I've learned a few tricks in my life, and I think what's very important is to learn how to become your own advocate, your own health advocate. And you know, I've got a bit of mouth on me, and it can, yeah, uh, I, I won't elaborate on that. And so I make sure that I get the best health care that I can. Um, but there's another thing that happened with me. Not, not only have I, do I have diabetes, but I have only one kidney. One kidney had to be removed. And um, when I was uh, getting instruction on how to prevent kidney stones, a, a doctor came in and he said, uh, he introduced him, himself and he said, um, oh, he had uh, studied in New Zealand or he had actually practiced in New Zealand. And then he said, um, he said, has anyone talked to you about having your kidney removed? And I says, well, no. It, it had actually, it had grown three times its size, so it had, to, it started to expand over to the other side of my cavity, right? And I said, no. But as soon as he said that, because of the discussion that had that had taken place before, he's been to New Zealand, he was here, and so on and so forth. We immediately had a relationship, and I immediately knew it's a good idea. Okay, so. Um, they arranged for my nephrectomy, which is the fancy word for sucking the kidney out, right? Um, but I think what happened was that, you know, how you kind of play that who knows who game. I think he talked to the people at the hospital, and so the the uh, the environment was already set for me uh, to have a good experience, and I was able to be well taken care of during that whole time period. Um, I also would wonder if there's a difference with how people in the uh, medical community work and interact with women versus men. I wonder if there is a bit of a difference there because it, it quite uh, possibly uh, could be that case. Now, the only thing that I uh, protested, um, and because the surgery might have caused a hernia, I had to have surgery uh, about three or four months later, is that without consulting me, uh, they prescribed opioids. And I can't take opioids because they make me sick. But, you know, that came out of my hotel, uh, my hotel bill, which is where I prefer to be. Um, that came out of my hospital bill. Um, and I had to dispose of them. And, you know, it's, it's a little easier to dispose of opioids now, uh, but it wasn't back then. You had to find a place that was accepting, accepting that. So, you know, my experience is a little bit different, but amazingly, I still have something to say. Huh? I, I, I want to speak a little bit. Um, so when I got hurt, uh, I, I just thought of something, and it's po it's a positive thing. Uh, I got hurt, and I was in Colorado, uh, and that's far away from my family. Uh, about two weeks into it, uh, I have a friend that works in the burn unit because my brother, he was uh, also burned by electricity, and he lost his arm. And uh, the friend recommended that I get transferred so I can be closer to family. Uh, and I, I think the, at first the workman's comp uh, insurance was kind of against it because it would cost money, but they finally agreed to have me transferred over there. And when I got transferred over, uh, I think my healing happened a lot faster when I was closer to home. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of times we don't know the power of being close to family, but I know the power for, for me being a Samoan and having strong families, that, 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 that power is strong, it's strong. It helps a lot to be close to families for Polynesian people. Can I? Uh, yeah, you first, yeah. Because I think we're going to talk sure. about some of uh, So one experience I had was, um, so we don't have any family here, but um, a lot of uh, friends and uh, community helped us during this pregnancy. Um, so when my daughter, the young uh, daughter was in um, the uh, NICU, I asked the Again, it's related to social work, uh, but you know they're in the medical social workers. So I asked, you know, like, uh, is there a way to help? Like, they wanted me to be there with my daughter, and I'm like, you know, I have been in and out of emergency after coming home because I was bleeding from my stitches, and uh, so 
the first thing is that to want a mother to be there and recognize only the mother as a parent was really in, not appropriate. It was really hurtful for my spouse because he really took care of our young daughter and he was the main provider because that time I needed the time to heal. And to make that the requirement for her to be discharged that I had to be there uh, like whole day like, um, and that was the requirement. You, so I had to go there. And when I asked them that, is there a way that you could help? Because we don't have, like, we live in the west side, and it's hard to come to get the tracks. It's like 10 block, 12 blocks of walking because there's no bus. And she's like, oh, why don't you take the tracks? I'm like, do you understand the situation that it's not possible to just take the tracks? I know how the tracks work. And so not. Uh, acknowledging the patients or the clients needs or the situation and then like giving suggestions without even considering that so and then the other thing was like she said oh why don't you put her in this emergency 24-hour daycare like my older daughter I'm like she's never been in a daycare and so like giving suggestions and things like that was like really um, not appropriate and actually, I want to support both of what you said. Uh, you know, when someone was talking about the fact that um, some hospitals, there was a time when you weren't allowed more than two patients in the room at the same time. Well, guess what, folks? The rest of the world is catching up with some of our practices because now they realize there are real curative effects when families are around you because it gives them it gives you that kind of healing success and I can tell you about lots of other things where the rest of the world is starting to catch up with native practices because you know we've been healing people without without all this modern technology for centuries and part of it is one of the problems with with the medical system right is it heals the physical body but it doesn't do anything for the social body for the mental body and for the spiritual body and that's what families do so we have a couple more questions here but um, for the sake of time we might not get to all of them um, so the next question I'm going to combine the two um, so how or have you or your family participated in a clinical trial and how was the experience and how, how does your community um, perceive clinical research uh, I, I haven't, uh, I've been approached about a clinical trial and they were um, putting uh, controllers for prosthetics inside your people's nerves and uh, I, I didn't perceive that my community thought anything about it. I didn't really tell them um, and I actually declined it but it was more because I couldn't uh, uh, play basketball if I had those things inside my arm. I'd have to keep it in plastic. And so I, f I felt that uh, being active was a huge part of being accepted by my community and my uh, my uh, family so I didn't uh, didn't participate in the study but I, I feel like it's hard because all these studies usually it's like a a little pinup on the wall mm -hmm. here at the hospital and it's not like we go exploring around the hospital and looking at walls you know <laughs> so uh, they need to get it out to the community more if they want people to participate. And if, if, you, if you want to see what the perception is of those, they need to get it out to the community as well because I don't, I'm not, I don't have an answer for that, you know? Uh, yes, I have participated and if that would be like, uh, this time in my stay in the hospital uh, because of my high risk. So I have type 2 diabetes. Um, during pregnancy, I had very high um, blood pressure and I was a preeclampsia. So they wanted everything to do with 
research they wanted to know and so um, I think I had like three or four people who came in my room and they wanted me to participate in the research um, but the way they would uh, say like they would never explain the consent form and being a researcher is important to me and I was like can you explain and like they would like just give like one or two line and I had to ask them can you leave the consent form and tell me like you know uh, and explain more about your research but it's very limited the explanations and I wish they did it better uh, the second thing is like uh, they wanted to draw blood and when I asked them how much vials you would need they would just say one or two but I ended up giving, I think, one time like uh, like 10 or something. And when I asked the person who was drawing the blood, I'm like, what do you need so many blood thing for? He's like, she was like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, uh, I thought it was just one or two. Haven't they said? So it was like from nowhere, I was already <laughs> in a make. And you know, and um, so it was, I had to get a blood, blood transfusion later. But it's like, there is no, um, uh, can, uh, communication between the researcher and the person who's drawing the blood or even like a right and giving a correct information to the participants is kind of needed and the second question I really won't be able to say what my community uh, feels about clinical research because uh, the Indian community here is very diverse we're really not connected to each other in that way because uh, most of them uh, if, if they're from here they have their own groups so everybody is in their own small pockets and groups so um, I won't be able to say what they perceive yeah. Okay, um, so uh, there's, there's a few things that I hope that I don't forget to say. First of all, um, so I happen to be on this national committee uh, that looks at clinical trials and how we might be able to, d to diversify involvement. Um, and I just needed something to, and uh, this was uh, my connection with the American com Indian community. This is where this came in, and I tried to think, well, what's a selling point? Uh, you know, American Indians and a lot of other people don't trust the government in general, and they're not going to trust uh, parts of their bodies with clinical trials, yes? And um, so, but there is a selling point, and I, I found out uh, when I was in a meeting in Seattle last week, is that... Um, I'm also, I also work with uh, HPV and uh, I discovered that the HPV vaccine does not work for a majority of American Indian women because they weren't involved in the clinical trials. So that's an important thing to know and as I talked with uh, Deanna Kepka up at Huntsman, she says it's possible because there are at least nine different strains of HPV and the, the, the um, vaccine used now more prolifically only treats four. So there, that's a reason that we need to be involved in clinical trials. How do I know, how do we know that our diabetes medication really works for us? It wasn't tried on people like us, right? It was tried b basically on a very small segment of society. And so once again, we don't know if these things uh, work for us. Okay. So now, in terms of clinical trials, someone's going to make a lot of money on the information that they get from us, and by gee, they should be paying you. You should be getting money for being involved in clinical trials. I know you might say, well, that's going to push up the cost of, uh, of um, med medicine and medical practices, but you know, I'm paying a lot of money on my insurance and I'm paying a lot of money for surgery. That money's going somewhere. How about it coming back to us if we're involved in these and pe people are, are gaining uh, information in terms of clinical trials? Um, I was invited to participate in a clinical trial, but you know, it was going to take about 20 hours and that's a lot of work time. So that's why I say there should be uh, some sort of compensation. Last point, I was at a meeting just yesterday uh, and the meeting uh, was about, uh, they brought together people involved in different areas of health provisions and it was um, to improve health care and health provisions in the state of Utah. Do you know that all the data that they showed up there on the board did not include people of color? And when we said, well, 
are you trying to diversify the data that you're collection, collecting? They said yes and then moved on very quickly. So, you know, we're, our people are not represented in lots of areas of healthcare. And I have a lot more to say about that, but I'm going to stop. I, I, I'd say one more thing. Uh, a lot of those flyers, they're up here in the hospitals on the east side, you know? Uh, the east side is uh, really have a lot of money. <laughs> and so you're not getting those people out there that possibly need it, you know? So that's, that's the other thing. Yeah, so I noticed that you all talked about um, clinical research lacking of um, where the information's given to and where um, the information you're providing is going and the exact detailed procedure is that there's lack of transparency in that and difference in options that you can choose as well and so to go with that um, with that being said um, as health professionals what can we do to communicate better about clinical trials or medicine in general uh, I think it'd be wise to have like an outreach um, branch of that and outreach into communities uh, with different ethnicities, especially um, the ones you're referring to, like here, Asian American and Polynesian or Pacific Islander. Uh, and I know a guy, Jacob Fittismanu, he, he does a good job of that. Uh, also get more people of those ethnicities into the program. Uh, as when they're in the program, they have networks themselves that they can access by using social media. Say, oh, we need this, this, this type of people for this study. Uh, that that's a, an excellent way. Um, um, yeah, like continuing his point. Um, also, like uh, reimbursements are so like he as he said. You know, you want 20 hours of the participants time but you if you pay ten dollars per hour i mean you know they're leaving they especially they you have like uh there is like programs which are there um, and it goes on in the for instance like uh, community center like they have some researches but it's like you want them in the evening, you're not providing transport, you're not thinking about that, you just pay $10 and there's a family of four and she has to, or he has to leave uh, their family and come and participate for your gain. Being a researcher, I, I, I come like both sides, I understand you need to do research to have uh, information to implement and you know make policies and make changes. But as a participant, I feel like there should be proper communication um, and proper reimbursement for the time. And yeah, there is nothing in the west side. Mm -hmm. but we, I live on the west side. And yeah, there is no one comes and approaches you for research only when you're at the U hospital. So, so I, leave, I, I live on the east side, and this is not part of the discussion, but I have the microphone. Um, <laughs> so one of the disadvantages with being a person of color that lives on the east side, I didn't figure it out until very recently why my brother will never jog around our community, because it's predominantly white, and he's afraid that they're going to call the cops. So that does have its challenges, huh? Um, and I endorse I everything that, that you, you um, have mentioned. Um, getting our own people into these programs as researchers and doctors I think is very important. I remember when, uh, I, I, I shouldn't point you out Pi'ilani, but Pi'ilani was a student of mine and at that time there's only one Pacific Islander faculty person on campus and that was me. And you know, I'm not I'm not the greatest representation because there's certainly a lot smarter Pacific Islanders than me around. And I think within the next year we're going to have maybe four, three or four, plus we have a uh, Hawaiian doctor at the uh, University of Utah. So definitely, I think um, you know by getting our own people there in positions is going to help. Um, the other thing, of course, and maybe a lot more people are going to see this, but. You know, I think this is probably the choir 
I'm not sure if you people really need this information. I think you might already be in tune with that. I'm not sure. But there certainly ought to be a lot more people involved in this sort of discussion. Thank you. Um, any final words or thoughts? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 if you want to find out uh, if your specific uh, remedy works on people of different ethnicities, you need to have them in the test. Uh, and and we, we always assume that uh, this, this body is the same, this body is the same, we're all the same, but all the different things need to be applied on an individual basis and and uh and a lot of times when I, when i got the email for this uh um panel i thought and and i i i teach the same thing to uh a class that my psychologist inv invites to talk to is that each patient is individual and so we need to t treat them as an individual uh, it, you may be working with a Pacific Islander, but that doesn't mean this Pacific Islander is the same as this Pacific Islander, right? Uh, each person is an individual. And it's funny, they call me a lot to come peer counsel to Pacific Islanders, and I'm like, you don't need to call me for them. They have a lot of peer counselors themselves. I'll come, but... Uh, uh, I'm not the the guy for that. Their their dad and their moms are there, and 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 uh, I'll come, but it's it's okay. Um, and so, I think that uh, a lot of the things that happen to patients also come down to down to the individual nurse. Uh, a lot of times, the nurse has preconceived notions about a specific uh, ethnicity. And then they'll they'll let that bleed out into their care for the patient, and so uh, that education that they're getting here it needs to be um, taught that each individual is an individual. Uh, you can't treat them all the same. You can't just say, "Oh, you have this. Oh, here's an antibiotic, or here's a, a acetaminophen, and see you later." It's it's all individual. So. That's my final thoughts. Um, I feel like uh, being a woman, um, women health is like, we can't really talk about it. Uh, having a lot of health issues, um, it's like no one is like wanting to talk about it or discuss. And so it's like in the community itself, like, um, I mean, being diabetic and you know, like having high blood pressure during pregnancy and all these issues, uh, it's kind of like looked down, looked down on. And I wish that even the healthcare providers acknowledges that each patient, like he said, is different, and you just cannot copy paste your remedies on us and uh, see each patient differently and. Um, as I said, the Indian community is so vast, um, and a lot of them are might be very affluent, and some of them are not. So uh, we are not very well connected, like you know, be it Pacific Islander community, the other Asian communities. Um, I shouldn't say that because um, maybe I'm not connected with them. But there are uh, so you know you cannot generalize. So I think a lot of time doctors and like med the medical field people like try to generalize based on their studies or clinical researches. I think that should not be done. Okay, so I have two big concerns and one of them is that I don't see a bright future for, uh, for health insurance. I'm very nervous. Two of us oh. have... Uh, oh, diabetes, yeah. Yeah, I am really, really nervous that I might, um, you know, I didn't have health insurance, especially being a student. I had health insurance and then they would not give me health insurance because of my type 2 
And I think we're going to be in the same situation again, and it's kind of scary. Thankfully, my diabetes is in control, but then that's not going to last. I'm getting old too, so it's kind of scary. Um, so <laughs> I'm the new moderator, have you noticed? <laughs> um, so yes, uh, those of us who have pre-existing con conditions, you know, and I already pay a lot of money for my health care and, and my medication, you know, every time I renew my meds, it's about $160, and that's a lot of money. Um, and so, of course, it's going to—it's a concern for me, and not just for for me as a diabetic, but I'm worried about. For example, I'm also on the state strategic plan. It sounds like I do a lot of things. It's not true. Um, I'm on the state tr strategic planning committee for uh, HIV prevention, and you know the key means by which they prevent HIV from spreading is through medication, and those med the medication is horribly expensive and I don't know what that is because I don't actually pay for it out of pocket but you know programs like the Ryan White program which helps uh, support uh, people with their medication I don't know what's what that's going to happen when um, these insurance things might change and my last soapbox statement for the day in my perception, the biggest epidemic that we have in this nation is diabetes. And why is no one trying to find a cure for it? Well, I know, but I'm not going to say. But please, someone, find a cure for diabetes. It's going to save people like us a lot of money. It's going to save the nation a lot of money. But I better stop there. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you for sharing your experiences. Experiences. Um, I want to open up the discussion and questions to the audience. Can I add? Yeah. Yes. For pre-existing condition, being a woman will be a pre-existing condition. <laughs> because you can be pregnant, that's pre-existing condition. And so, you know, like giving birth is pre-existing condition and then if your child is in the NICU that'll be also considered as pre-existing condition so you know like uh, children born with a con like anything or um, uh, they staying in in the ICU they will reach their lifetime cap and there will be no they cannot take health insurance after that because it's like a, um, yeah so we're going to be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Just because of the people of color, everything fits in the puzzle, huh? Oh, it's not even in the puzzle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I work in diabetes. You might not know where that program is. How many suggestions? Out there. Okay, go ahead. No, no, you say something. <laughs> so, um, when I got diagnosed with diabetes, it was after a surgery I had, and I was pre-diabetic. Um, not before the surgery, I was perfectly fine. So, uh, after the surgery, um, I was referred to the diabetic center up at the campus. They were really good. Um, but the thing is, this that what they told me is. Because of my family history of my family having diabetes, that was, there were four reasons they gave. One was that being a woman who immigrated had higher risk of getting diabetes, and doing PhD was the stress level, was the third reason, and the fourth was age, which was the only thing which I didn't qualify. And so, you know, like, it's like, uh, I did not know what to do then, even though I was not, uh, like, I was following their dietary restrictions, but uh, it didn't change. I mean, my A1C is 5.5. Technically, I'm not diabetic, if you just see, because a normal person would have the same blood sugar on the daily basis, which I have, but once you are, you given that thing, like, label, oh, you're diabetic, even if you don't, Call, like you know day-to-day -day life you might not have any sugar thing um, yeah so that 
I don't know, like your question, like how do you reach to the communities? You know, there are a lot of like community centers at the west side, like the Sorensen Community Center. They do a lot of work. The university neighborhood program is there. The, uh, so all these, you know, the nonprofits are there. Like if the um, if if. CDC can reach to them and maybe do like a class because or the domestic violence shelter home and they, because women or men go who are in these um, who are families taking services go through a lot of stress and that's one of the reasons so um, and also like you know the food um, there are so much food deserts if you go uh, just if you cross third west and you go uh, I we st I live in Poplar Grove. It was like really, if you need to go to a store, like it's just one, like you know Smiths, and then like Rancho Market is like you know five ten blocks away. Or so if you don't have a car, I mean, what do you do? You go to maybe go to Seven Eleven and buy something. So ha like already like the structure is set up to make you get diabetes or other lifestyle diseases. So I don't know. Apart from going and reaching to these. Uh, already set up resources, maybe you can uh, network with them and do like awareness programs or I don't know how you can increase more health, healthy food resources uh, and yeah yeah I think it is important because sometimes they don't know the situation that, um, you know, and, and they just go like, oh, eat a tomato a day or, you know, don't eat this potato uh, this this much amount only or don't eat a cornbread or tortilla or this. But seriously, what is available? And also like the diabetes when they, like the education when they do, I've noticed that they do not reciprocate to the cultural food. Like uh, for me, it was so hard to explain what I eat to the educator, and I had to come down with my own portion size and my own calculations. And they did not have it, so um, I feel like the 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 education, the booklet they have doesn't fit our community. You know, we eat differently, and then you want to portion according to what. The food samples they bring, like, oh, here is a tortilla sample, and here is like a corn sample. I mean, okay, not everybody is eating tortilla and corn and beef slabs, or you know, things. So I think you c c changed a little bit. So, uh, c congratulations on your low blood sugar. I would like to be at that stage. I got to tell you that my most recent A1C was 9.5. And that's why I needed a doctor desperately. And I concur with everything that she said. There are actually a lot of organizations out, of, out in the community that are doing things. And so it's uh, the secret thing is connecting with them. And actually, a lot of them are already doing things that you would like to know about. And of course, when you go out into a community, it's, you don't go with the attitude, I'm here to fix you. It's ask them what they think their needs are, sort of like doing their own little community assessment, yes. Um, so I think uh, those are very important things. But you know, talking about food, I mean, let's look at the food that, that's available even in the grocery stores. Everything in all the middle aisles is bad for you. Try looking at the, the, um, the ingredients that are in these things, and it's horrific. But people haven't been trained to do that, yes? My last point, encourage them to drink a lot of water. It's a tough one. Yeah. I, I, uh, I like the point about uh, education, uh, knowing the population at least a little bit before you go out there. And the best way to do that, you know, get someone on your board or your, your <coughs> committee that is of that ethnicity. Uh, the other thing I thought about while we're sitting up here, education. You guys are in the field of um, the medical field. And you can educate the people. Like, like I said in the beginning, I didn't know about second opinion. Uh, I'm from uh, a home where your dad says something, you do it. And you don't question why, you don't question this, you don't question that. But uh, you're allowed to educate those patients, say, hey, 
you can look for a second opinion. That's okay. It's not a, a, a final in the stone commandment when you receive something from a doctor and information from a doctor. So. Yeah, and with that, I just wanted to quickly say that um, since we're talking about APIA health and we talk about diabetes, um, there's always this lack of data disaggregation that we don't see in, for example, diabetes, which is a great example of when we talk about um, data disaggregation. Because, um, for example, when, when you look at the API health, APIA health in general, it's not breaking down who is at risk for diabetes. So when you combine these um, non-diabetic Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans who um, you know, dominate the population of the API health, it's kind of not covering the part of um, PIs who, who may have, who may suffer, you know, diabetes, which should be a public health concern. Yeah. So, um, with that, we are five minutes over time, so I wanted to wrap up and thank our panelists for being here. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>